So records management in Office 365, why is it important? Um, particularly in Queensland, Sorry, guys. Uh, we have seen a release of a new records governance policy. Um, this is not discluding other states, though. So this presentation is not intended just for Queensland. It's applicable across the country. Um, having said that, though, um, what that release of that new policy has meant is that um, we're looking at new ways and new challenges and new opportunities. So. Um, I'm sure most of you can sympathise that many organisations are facing the challenge of developing new ways to manage multiple information repositories, and this has very much been brought about by the inevitable transition into Office 365. Um, so Mick Tish see our role as being one to facilitate the collaboration between agencies, um, helping you to identify and support and implement innovative systems that will support you in navigating your approach to strategic records management. So one of the keys to achieving good governance is to take a proactive approach to what is happening now within your agency. Um, I'm sure some of you would already have implemented, be implementing or post implementation. There are tools that can help you to start on the front foot. Uh, even if you have implemented, um, they can be used to um, I guess, instill governance post-implementation um, and they're used to apply standards to the information being created in Office 365. So I'm going to show you a cloud governance platform today that I've configured um, with a records management spin. So predominantly it's an IT based system, but I'm demonstrating how records can advocate in IT um, for systems like this and how you can be involved in the process. So I wanted to um, be very clear that what I'm presenting today is not what you would consider a compliant records management solution in Office 365. The intent of this presentation is to provide you with some knowledge to take a proactive approach um, to your ongoing transition to Office 365. Um, to be innovative and to, to talk to your IT departments about um, how this system could potentially be used within your organisation. So I'm hoping by the end of this presentation that you'll have enough knowledge um, to open those conversations within your agencies with IT about applying governance to Office 365. So Office 365 provisioning um, using this particular tool um, is made up of these five elements. So it's important to start at the provisioning um, to get the best outcome. So this means at the very beginning of the process, when a user gets access to a new repository to store records, that's where we want to be on the front foot. So how often do we see the new repositories being created and RIM are the last to know about it? I'm sure you can all relate to that. And the question I'm going to ask is, what if you were the first to know and you didn't have to ask about it? So that's what I'm going to show you today. So often within agencies, we develop policies in the written form and often these are forgotten, ignored or implemented incorrectly. Um, particularly in the IT space and more so when it comes to storing information. So using a system to enforce policy is a guaranteed way to ensure that the policy is adhered to. We're also going to look at services and requests. These provide the mechanism to capture metadata before the group, the team, the site, the library is provisioned. And we're also going to look at a staged approval process, which is where RIM professionals can become involved in, in the provisioning of repositories. And this is where you get to have your cake and eat it too. Um, this is where we can force approval by RIM, force notification into records and information management. Um, and we can also have uh, our piece in terms of adding metadata to the site for the requirements that we need to manage the information. 
part of that's injecting metadata against the site, the group or the team or the library. And I'm also going to show you um, some of the reports that we can generate out of the system. So I'm going to jump out of the presentation now and into the system to show you the process uh, from end to end. So what I'm going to be covering today is we have three user accounts, one being an end user, the second being the end user manager, and the third acting as the information management professional and the IT administrator. So I'm going to step you through from request to provisioning and show you the outcome. So I just want you to bear in mind, I am just doing a group team workspace. This can be applied to communication sites, collaboration sites, lists, libraries, et cetera. So a number of the repositories that you see created in Office 365. Okay, so I'm now here in the end user account. As you can see, I have Sarah end user. So what you see here is actually the governance platform uh, that can be used. Um, but I just wanted to show you that the process starts over in the Office 365 environment. So what I've done in SharePoint is I've created a custom tile, um, which can be done in your environment, which is linking me into cloud governance. So this is where the user request the site or the group or the, the artifact within Office 365 where they're going to be storing information. So by clicking on the start a new request form, this is going to take the user to a form that is going to request a number of elements to enter into the form before they can get their site or repository. Apologies for the delay. Okay. Just while that one sits there, here's one I prepared earlier. Um, so this is a request that was submitted by Sarah End User and within her governance platform, which is accessed via Office 365, we have a My Requests area. So I can open up and have a look at the request and we will jump back to start a new one now that it's available. So this is what the end user is presented with. So the end user has put in a request to ask for a new team workspace. And what we're doing here is we're capturing information from that end user. So I'm going to go ahead and do one for project management is what I'm asking for. So this is just a summary. This isn't going to be the name. Um, so I'm just going to change that and say request a site, project management, um, managing the big project. Okay, now these are the elements that we can configure. I've left them all turned on at this stage so that I can actually demonstrate for you. When we move across to the administrative side, I'll show you where that's done. So this is asking, is this going to be a public or a private site? Public meaning anyone can see the content, private meaning that only members of the team workspace or group can access the content. We have options as to whether or not we want to have copies of group conversations sent to the group. And we can also select whether we allow outside senders um, to access the group. So that's people outside of the organisation. These components have been configured by the administrators of the system. I'll come back to those when we go through that component. Here the user can add members to the group. So they can do that by typing a name. Okay, 
and add them to the group. That will give them automatic group membership. Just going to take them out because I don't want to add them as we provision it. Now this is where we start to, things start to get interesting in terms of what we're able to do with a system like this from a records management point of view. So what I've actually done here, now bear in mind we're provisioning a new site. So before it's actually created, it's going to be created with this metadata against it. Now I've set them up as examples. You can set up anything that you like. I've used some records management terms in here and they are just examples. You can use anything that's going to be relevant to the governance or the management of information based on your organisation, your agency and the requirements. So I've used some of the typical terms here being activity, function, department, retention style, retention period. These are all metadata elements that will go against that group and they will remain there and they can be injected down into other areas of the site. So we can select the activity. I've put a couple in, for example, I'm just going to say asset planning. This is a managed metadata set coming from SharePoint. So from your organisation point of view, you would set up all of your departments. Just going to select one here being development services. I can select the function. So again, based on your activity. Now I would reorder these as well on the form. Um, so you may want to have it more sensical in terms of function activity subject if that's going to be useful to you but the um, the ideas there so we're going to say that the function is asset management in terms of the retention style I've set three up in here you can have as many as you like I'm going to say that the retention style is to archive transfer custody and then the retention period, again, this is configurable. I'm going to say it's five years. Uh, the team, again, organisational, so we'll just say strategic planning. And then this is where we enter the, the name of the group. So this is going to be Asset Project Management. The group ID will automatically be populated and the group description we can leave blank. So at this point, the end user can save and submit that request and that's going to now trigger an approval process. Okay, so there's my requests and I've now triggered the approval process. So the second step in the process is for me now to look at that as the end users manager. So in terms of governance, we're saying that anybody who requests a group or a team workspace, that needs to be approved by their manager. So you'll see some relationship. It's, it's like a workflow in an EDRMS. As the manager, I can look at the detail that's been put in the request. So you can see here that that information is all available to me. I can see what metadata has gone against that site. And I can also see the basic information. So my role now as the manager is to, if I approve of that request, oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong place. I need to jump out. I need to jump across to the to-do list for the manager, which is where I was. Beg your pardon, it's um, difficult when you've got three profiles running. So we'll just go back into that one again. So you can see here as the manager, I've got options to edit that request. I can reassign it, reject it and approve it. 
And this is all going to be audited and maintained in a request history. So it's automatically uh, recording your audit detail around who requested the site, who approved it, etc. If I want to edit the request, I can. So I can go in and I can either add more approvers, I can um, change who's in the group, etc. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to approve it so it moves to the next stage. I can add comments for my approval here and click OK. So that's my step now as the manager has been completed. Now I'm going to move across into the records manager profile and go to the to-do list of tasks. And you can see here I've now been notified. So the other thing I want to show you is that as this is happening, we will see notifications in the mailbox. So again, it's very much like a workflow. Approvers will receive notification and they know that they have a task to do. So now as the records manager, I'm going to go in and have a look to see if I'm happy with the information that's been put in against the request. And as I showed you before, we can edit it. And where it really comes into play from an IM perspective is dependent on the information that you've put into your service and into the request around what you're capturing for metadata. This is where you get the opportunity to, to really add some value for your own processes. So majority of the information we're going to be happy with. But when we get down into our retention areas, this is where we may wish to add additional information or change the information. So again, I just want you to bear in mind, I've done basic fields for the purpose of demonstration. Um, there would be no reason why you couldn't have uh, metadata sets containing the schedules that you want to apply against that function, um, whether you wanted to have um, any other information management element that you wanted to add, you could do um, and have that recorded against the site. So I'm now going to approve that request. So we can see that the comments from the previous approval are here. I'm now approving it. Now because I've used the same account for the records manager and the IT team, I've now got another task to approve that request. So I'm just going to jump back here to Sarah, the end user. And you can see she's being updated at all times as to what's going on with her request. <coughs> so it's keeping that information live and we can see that it's been approved now by the records team and by her manager. So if you can picture that email saying has been approved by information management services or whatever you call yourself within your agency, the end user's kept up to date throughout the whole process. It's audited and there's a view across the organisation of what's happening with that. So now as IT, I'm happy. The end user's made the request. The managers approved it. Information management have had their opportunity to add the relevant metadata to the request. Now I'm going to approve it, which is going to trigger the provisioning of that team workspace. So now if we go back to Sarah and just refresh her mailbox.
we'll see that it's been approved now and shortly we'll receive a notification that that group and site has been created. There's the notifications that came through to the manager to let him know. Um, this one's a site that I did earlier. And we can see here. So you can see there's active links within the emails for the approval process as well. So this is just a three-stage, three-step approval process, a basic straightforward one. We're going to hop across into the system in a minute and I'm going to show you how that's configured. Um, I'm not going to go into lengthy detail. It is quite a um, broad system. There's a lot that you can do with it. I'm just going to show you what I have configured um, for the purpose of this demonstration so you can see what happens in the back end. going to make sure that we don't have any other steps waiting. So you can see I have zero tasks pending. We come back to the end user as well. We can see there's still another request there that hasn't been processed as yet. So it's sitting there to let her know. If I go in and have a look at um, okay. my sites, because I did not that one. Sorry. In the end user. Never mind that. I was expecting to see one there. Okay, so let's go and have a look at the actual platform now. So in terms of the configuration, this is where we can set up those elements to be included in the request form. So the policy is what allows us to create some rules around what uh, happens at the provisioning of a site or a workspace. So I need to deactivate it so I can actually edit it and have a look at it. Apologise for the delay here. So I'm just going to edit this policy. So this is what I specifically set up to provision a group or team within the organisation. So I'm just going to scroll through and cover off the main elements. So things that I can do that are relevant to records and information management, I can set a quota on the size of the site. So I've allowed them five gig. I can manage the life cycle of the site. So you can see here that in terms of um, enabling an extension, that can happen after 120 days. So that's around being able to manage um, sites and I'm going to go into some more detail around what that means. Group inactivity, this is, I mean, how many times do you see end users request a repository, a site, a group, and then they don't use it? What I'm saying here in this policy is I'm enabling an inactivity notification. So if there's been no activity in this particular repository for 90 days, it's going to start notifying people. Again, that notification process can be configured to include RIM staff um, as a trigger to go and have a look at that repository, the information within it, 
and manage it accordingly. We have lease management. So this is like a rental tenancy. This is the time frame. These are very much IT settings here. It's just to give you an idea of the types of questions you can start to ask about your environment. So in this case, this after 150 days, a notification will come out about the group lease to basically to, to check whether or not that group's still required. And if not, then that information can be managed accordingly. We have recertification, which I'll talk about a little bit more in another slide. Um, it's part of the process in terms of renewing the lease. So we can actually set parameters around sites requiring recertification. I set it to one day because I was hoping to get a notification to show you today of what that looks like. So you can see within the policy, I can um, apply some governance based on agency rules as to how things are provisioned in the very beginning. So I'm just going to save and reactivate that. And I'm going to come back to settings and I'm going to show you an approval process. So I've created one here being the information management approval process. Again, I just need to deactivate it so we can go in and have a look at it. Going to edit that one. So this is where I can add my steps for approval. This is where you get in the loop, guys. This is what you want in place so that you can see what's going on in your organisation. So it's a three-stage process. Um, within those three stages, we can see down here what's happening for approvals. So I'm using some of the smarts within the system and I'm saying that the first stage of approval is the manager of the person that requested the site. There's settings for templates and emails. I'm not going to spend too much time on that and also for escalation. Stage two. So this is the approval for the team workspace to be created from the records and information management team. I've assigned this to a specific account. You can assign it to multiple people. You can have multiple approvers. And again, templates for emails, etc. And then in stage three is where it goes to IT for the provisioning of the site. So you can see here from a governance point of view, you don't you're not doing anything, you're automatically in the loop, you're going to be notified when a new repository is going to be created. You have an opportunity to inject metadata into that and you have an opportunity to ask questions um, before approving those um, sites to be created. So it's giving you an insight um, without you having to go and ask, you're going to be notified as part of that process. So I'm just going to save and reactivate that one again. And now I'm going to go to the service and then we'll touch on also the, the metadata. So the metadata is used within the service. So again, I need to deactivate. So the service, um, if you can cast your mind back, that's the little tile in the Office 365 space where I had request a new team workspace. And again, these can be configured for a number of elements within your Office 365 environment. So this is what creates the request form. This is where we can mandate the entry of information. And this is where we govern and manage how things are provisioned within our space. So you can see that my service is used to provision a new group and team. Again, it could be to provision a communication site, a site collection, a collaboration site, a library, a list, etc. We've got some ownership around the department that it belongs to as far as the service. Generally, that will be IT. 
we have a service contact, administrator contact. This stuff is, is part of setting it up in the technical environment. So you can see here, if you can remember back on the form when I filled it in as Sarah, we had the option to make the site public or private. What I can do is I can actually change who can, who can um, change that setting. So I can say that that's assigned by the IT admin and I can remove that from view for the business user also by unticking this box. So from an agency governance perspective, if you wanted everything to be public, if that was your stance, you would tick that to be public. I would change this to be assigned by IT admin and hide that from the business user. So the outcome of that is on the form that privacy is not going to appear. And wherever you see these options, you can change to the same setting so that the end user doesn't need to enter that information. Outside senders we looked at. This is where I'm enabling the creation of a Microsoft team for this group. So for those of you that don't know, every team workspace has a group behind it and I'm enabling that here. If I wanted to just have a group, then I wouldn't enable that. And again, I can hide that. And you can see that I have. So that wasn't on the form. It's assigned by the IT admin and I've hidden it. Language is straightforward. If you did need to use another language for companies that are multi-tenanted in across different countries, you could do that. Contacts for the group. I'm using some of the smarts. So we know the primary contact will be the requester. Showing as read only. The secondary contact is the manager of the requester. I've hidden that from the business user. The group owner is the requester. So these are all elements that are going to go against your site. So when you're looking in your environment and you've got 300 team workspaces, you're going to be able to see who the owner is and who you should contact if you need to address any IM requirements. Uh, group members, again, we can, we can actually assign those by IT or the, we can allow the business user to do that. This is where I attach the policy. So you remember we looked at the policy before coming into the service. This is where I can attach the policy. So this is the group team provisioning policy. So this is where the group's only going to be provisioned for six months. It's going to require a recertification. It's going to send a notification to let everybody know if it's inactive. I've applied that into the service. So whenever a request comes through, that policy is going to be in motion. This is where the metadata can be added. So you can see it's quite a simple process. I click add metadata. I can select from the ones that we already have created or whilst I'm in here, I can create metadata. And there's a number of options to do that. Again, I'm not going to go into great detail. Effectively, there's two elements, one being a managed metadata set, which is part of your term store in SharePoint, or you can create metadata within cloud governance, which will be applied to your artifacts in Office 365. So you can see I've got multiple options of how I'm going to create metadata. So if you're not using term sets or you don't have those in the environment, you can still achieve the same outcome by creating metadata within cloud governance. So I'm just going to cancel that. Um, send through any questions on metadata, please, um, on instant message. Um, I'm happy to cover that more extensively because it really is the section where I see value for records and information management in governing, controlling, managing the environment. Um, this section here is just around how the group name gets constructed, what links will be available in the team workspace, and we'll go and have a look at that shortly. And this is where I inject my approval process into the service. So every single time one of these requests is done, it's going to come through IM and you're going to have an opportunity to manage that um, repository. This is just some customization that we can make there. 
So I'm going to save and reactivate that. So just coming back into the settings area, we'll quickly touch on metadata. So you can see here, if I don't want to do that within the service, I can do that here. The same process applies. I can create my metadata elements here. And then when I'm configuring the service, I can add those into the service. So the main points um, in terms of what I wanted to cover are these four tiles here. You can see that there's a raft of other things that we can do within the cloud governance platform. Uh, perhaps we'll cover those on another day, but today I just wanted to cover those off for you to give you an understanding of how important it is to, to get that metadata injected at the provisioning of the site. Um, and particularly the visibility, um, because we know that um, particularly in Office 365, things can get out of control quickly and we don't necessarily have um, the best overview of those environments, but this is where a product like Cloud Governance um, will give you what I would say is um, governance automation. So often we write policies down, as I said earlier, um, they don't get followed or we don't have uh, a mechanism for approvals or we're using uh, you know, non-modern ways of doing things through emails and sending requests and approvals and trying to track everything. It's all going to be tracked here for you in this platform. So let's just jump back and see what's happened for Sarah. Okay, so Sarah's just received notification that her request is now being completed. So we can see here that she now has, is a member of that group. She's been notified that her site now exists um, and she can go ahead and access that site. In terms of the management platform, I just want to come back to here and just have a quick look at the reports. So the first one I'm going to show you is a group report because we're provisioning groups. So this is where you start to get your overview of what you actually have in your system. So if you can imagine if you've got a number of groups that have been provisioned, you're going to be able to generate reports and export them out and look at them and see what you've actually got in your environment based on criteria that's meaningful to you as an information management professional. I can sort, obviously I don't have enough data here, but you can see I've got the option to sort by function I can sort by any of the columns that are available to me to look across my environment and see what groups and sites do I have, what function do they relate to, how are they, what retention styles being applied to them, what's the period, etc. So it's important to note this is just metadata going against the site. It's not giving you a mechanism to go ahead and manage those sites um, accordingly. There are ways that you can do that with this product. I'm not covering that today. This is just giving you an insight into what you can do early in the piece to get on the front foot as far as your environment's concerned. Okay, so I'm just going to come back now to cover off those terms that I've mentioned throughout the process. Um, so we talked about leasing, um, talked about inactivity and recertification. Leasing, as I said, is the period that the group or the site or the team gets a tenancy, just like a rental agreement in a property. We give them six months in that site and then we can um, review that for currency and for um, adherence to rules, etc. And we can automate the notification um, of the lease. 
The same applies with inactivity and recertification. So if you can um, visualise that you now have a report that shows you all of the sites, you also have the sites themselves, which I'll show you how you can see um, some of that information against the site. You also have a mechanism to review and recertify. And we can also use this tool to archive sites. So there is, I'm not going to cover that or show you that, but there is functionality of a similar nature using the same types of services policy to actually go through and execute your archiving processes. And one of the biggest advantages um, in terms of managing or governing your 365 environment with a product like this is the auditability. So from an auditor perspective, uh, everything is audited. You are able to produce reports that show what's been provisioned, when it was provisioned, who approved it, how long it was leased for, how long it was active, when it was made inactive, when it was deleted. Um, and you can also show the metadata that's been recorded against those items. So in terms of managing the Office 365 environment, it's um, this can be applied across a number of where you will see information repositories. It can even be used to manage the users. So if you're needing to um, add a list or add a library to a site um, or a team workspace, cloud governance can be used to do that. And again, it's going to provide you with the opportunity to inject metadata. It's going to audit it and it's going to give you your reporting. So just to come back out of the space, I'm just going to go back to Sarah and let's see. What we've got here. Yeah, what we might do is jump back here. So I'm just going into the team site now to have a look. Hopefully uh, most of you are familiar with Microsoft Teams. So, okay, so we can see now that that site has been provisioned. Now from the front end, it's difficult to um, show what information has gone against that particular um, site. But if we go out into SharePoint and open that, um, so apart from your reports where you can can generate those and, and look at your sites, etc., there's also um, ways in which we can um, look at the information because I just really want to show you um, how clever it is in terms of, and I may not have it installed in this view, sorry. Um, let's just go out to this. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to show you that right now, but perhaps if anybody's interested in that, effectively what I wanted to show you is how the site property bag has been updated with those metadata elements that will remain with that site um, for the life of the site. Um, so just to come back again, if we just to have a look in terms of um, that workflow. Effectively, from an IM point of view, a lot of what I've covered today would be 
as I said, discussions with your IT department around how a tool like this could be used and get on getting in early at provisioning. From an IM point of view, um, sitting within this space here, having a to-do list that gives you your approvals. Um, when recertification starts, we can look at recertification tasks. So this is where um, a site is going to come through to you to be recertified for continued use. So again, when applying governance, if it's not being used in the way in which it should be, this is your opportunity to intervene. Um, you can also look at your sites and you can also look at any groups that you may be a member of. Um, so that's covered off everything that I wanted to show you today. I hope you found some, some value in it and I hope that it certainly um, triggered some, some thinking into that proactive management because if you can take control of your environment at the provisioning stage, um, certainly if you're looking to implement alternate EDRMS systems within the Office 365 environment, having that um, governance applied early is going to be beneficial, save you time and save you money uh, down the track. Um, and certainly for those of you who are already on that journey, if you are thinking that you have some concerns or you're wanting to look at ways in which this could be um, put into your organisation, it's not too late. Um, there's import mechanisms that will allow us to um, apply that metadata to any sites created outside of AvPoint and apply the policies, et cetera, um, into the environment so that you can um, have an end-to-end -end solution um, from your historical provisioning and going forward into the future. So thank you for coming in and certainly um, encourage the discussion and the questions um, from today.